Hello, and welcome to the Psychic Wave Podcast. I'm your host, Andrew Sanishin, and on this episode, I spoke with Jackie Cohen. Jackie Cohen is a singer-songwriter, poet, and all-around badass human. Um, I actually took the podcast on the road for this one and drove out to meet her in Los Feliz. Uh, it's right next to one of my favorite places to eat, so that was pretty good for me. But uh, Jackie has toured with um, Foxygen and is currently working on some solo material. And if you stick around towards the end of the podcast, you'll hear a live performance of her song, For You. I really enjoyed uh, speaking with Jackie. She's super cool. And I can't wait to see her again. I hope you enjoy the podcast. Thank you. gonna be silent for a little bit to like edit out some room noise <laughs> in post but welcome to the 36th 36th episode of the psychic wave podcast and i am with jackie cohen hi is it it's jackie cohen radio now or is it just jackie um cohen? well i changed my name on my on our marriage contract right but i haven't changed it anywhere else okay so i'm not actually sure what the legality is of it at I'm this just point <laughs> going off of what i read on your instagram it says jackie cohen rado i think yeah i just changed it back for branding purposes oh okay okay no, <laughs> i'm just just wondering just trying to like get your uh, intro right well it's weird you know because it's you know my last name or whatever but it's also like rado's first name like we've o- we've always called rado rado Oh, right, right, I right, call right. him Rado, and, I've like, even his mom calls him Rado at this point, which yeah. is weird because she's also Rado. Oh, um, yeah. And so... It's a badass name, though. I mean, it's, like, our names are always really cool. Yeah, it's got, like, a... Yeah, it's solid. It's, it's a, you know, authoritative. It's funny, my... <laughs> there he goes. My, um... <laughs> <laughs> my, uh... Biological father, his name is John Vincente, and uh, my stepdad, his name is Joseph Ryan... Mm-hmm. And my mom and everyone in the world called my biological father JV, and now my stepdad's everyone calls him JR. Huh. So it's like, what's up with you, you and these J initial people, mom? Well, also just like lazy people. Why doesn't anyone just say anyone's full name? My stepdad doesn't like his name because <laughs> um, his parents gave it to him for religious reasons, Joseph. Right. And right. my dad's <laughs> totally not religious. Right. Um, yeah, but it's nicknames are cool. Right. I've been Drew ever since. I was gonna ask you because grade. you're Andrew, but then yeah, also Drew. I I don't think I've fulfilled the full capability of what Andrew is supposed to be. Andrew sounds like my mom expects a lot of me, <laughs> but I feel like oh. Drew is more of a like. No, oh, it's just Drew. <laughs> so, are you someday going to transform into Andrew or? No, I think Andrew Van Wingarden. He's the the full Andrew. Right. He's the fully formed version of me. That's what I like to tell people. Oh, okay. <laughs> like, like I'm the the Pokemon version right before you get to br- be really badass. Oh, right. Yeah. So he's he's already taken it. Oh, man. It's okay. It's okay. We're actually the same. Not that I... <laughs> I just told you that I don't get into these sort of things, but we have... Him and I have the same, like, um, astrology signs. Like He's an Aquarius, too? Down to, like... Yeah, but we also have, like, the same moon or something. What's your moon? I have no fucking idea. It's whatever his is. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> so I just I just looked it up for like a really lame reason. But yeah, I'm here with Jackie Cohen, maybe Rado, we don't know the legality of it. But um I had first seen you on how did it be just Instagram, just probably scrolling through like stuff going on in LA. Mm-hmm. And then I saw you played music and I was like, "Oh, her music's good. Might as well ask if she wants to come on the podcast." And so I'm here in beautiful Los Feliz, and uh, you've welcomed me into your humble abode. No, not mm-hmm. even humble. This is a badass fucking place. It's very cool. Lots I like of it here. I love toys. Toys. Yeah. <laughs> Boys and their toys. <laughs> There's a lot of junk. Oh, but good junk. Good junk. It is. Um, but yeah. So we'll get into uh, present day a little later on. But okay. Where did you grow up? Um, I grew up in Agora Hills, California, which is a 
suburb about an hour north of here. Um, and it's a, it's sort of like, I always refer to it as like a gas station town. Cause like if you didn't, you know, live there, mm-hmm. you would only ever stop there to like fill up your car. Oh, okay. um, Cause there's nothing to do there. Um, which was actually kind of, uh, good for like the arts in a lot of ways. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of kids from my high school went on to do creative things. Okay. Awesome. Because there was just nothing fun to do besides playing music and kind nothing. of pretending you're all rock and roll and breaking the rules. Yeah, like maybe a few kids like longboarded. Oh, shit. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. Actually, fun fact, uh, my high school um, was also the high school of uh, Hoobastank. Oh, my God. Uh-huh. <laughs> I think they like won the Battle of the Bands or something. I bet they fucking did. <laughs> Battle of the Bands, that's just such a bad representation of, like, <laughs> music. But I think it's it's good. It's a good gauge for, like, kids to, to start realizing, like, music. Uh, you know how everybody around you plays and get used to performing. But Yeah. I mean, it's cool. I never did anything like that. I was never really, like, in a band in high school. Like, I did a couple of shows with, you know, Rado, um and by doing shows i mean like they played a whiskey show Mm -hmm. and um i stood on stage and looked scared Uh, and didn't do anything um it still counts yeah you're up there they're down there (laughs) yeah so that was like that was really my only um that was as far as my participation in like music uh not music in general i was in like plays and choir and stuff but okay. in as far as being in a band goes that's all i did in high school so you like performing though so you were in in choir and um in plays yeah i was like a musical theater kid i started okay. doing it when i was like 5 because my sister did it and mm-hmm. i did everything my sister did oh okay yeah um, so yeah i have a little brother and i don't think he likes anything that i do although he just asked me to dye his hair Ooh. And uh, cause I my hair is usually purple, but it's faded out. Yeah. And um, he was like, "Can you dye my hair red?" And I was like, "Yeah, okay, I'll do it right now." Oh, that's sweet. But uh, he's like four years younger than me, and he's six foot five. It's it's daunting. Wow. But um, I was always jealous of theater kids and kind of probably an asshole to them, like in high school, because Wait, what, I, what what kind of kid were you? A skater. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, <laughs> skater, long hair, like stealing people's girlfriends, you know. The oh, usual. yeah. Every but, day. Uh, <laughs> it was easy when you rode a skateboard and told the teachers to fuck off. But <laughs> I don't know what it is, but like any rebellion is like attractive to, to girls in junior high for some reason. Right. Bad boy stuff. But um, I wasn't even that bad. I think I'd like ding dong ditch somebody ha- somebody's house and that's like the worst thing I ever did. <laughs> Oh, but man. I was mean to the theater kids, I think, because I was jealous because I had done one acting class and I loved it. And I just was too caught up in my ego to like oh. tell myself like, hey, maybe you should just join them. <laughs> and now like all my friends are like theater kids and people who play music. Yeah. And uh, you had to repress your theater bug. Yeah, I you know, it took one good acid trip. <laughs> and then I was like, oh, oh shit, I need to turn <laughs> some shit around. Um. I'm not even kidding. Like, scared the shit out of me. But in a good way. Wow. In a good way. Um, So you did the theater thing and um, the choir thing. Mm -hmm. And which did you like better? Um, I don't know. I mean, it was a lot of the same kids in both. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, it was was a fairly large scene, the, like, performance arts scene in my high school. Um, And... You know, if, as far as acting went, I really liked being involved more than I actually liked doing it. Mm-hmm. Um, I was very, very self-conscious in high school. Um, I didn't really like anyone looking at me. I uh, I had braces until, like, junior year, mm-hmm. and I, I always, like, laughed behind my hand, and I still mm-hmm. kind of do that sometimes. Oh, that's funny. Um, it's, you know, it's like a tick. Yeah. Um, and so it was actually very, like, stressful and painful for me to... Um, get up and do things in front of people but it's what all Mm -hmm. my friends do or what all my friends did and um my like being part of that scene was very important to me yeah um choir it it was also very much like that and it was also kind of like an exclusive thing because there were there were like tiers of choir Mm -hmm. and um and if you were in 
like choir two or whatever, you were like a big dog Ooh, shit. on campus. Yeah. And, uh, you know, you got to go like sing at Carnegie Hall oh, and, yeah. and shit like that. Sorry. Can I curse? Is that OK? Oh, fuck. Yeah. Is this is this public radio? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's available <laughs> to the public. but um, Yeah. So I don't know. I, I really liked doing it. But I always kind of liked the idea of doing it. Like I would sort of, I always like kind of fantasized about being like the lead in a in a play or something. Yeah, but course. when it came down to it, I was very very uncomfortable. Really, um, and had a hard time like ever delivering. Mm-hmm. Um, and for that reason, my teachers got were like really mad at me all the time. Yeah, because <laughs> you wanted to do it, but you just you couldn't really. Uh live up to it and I couldn't get over that like hump of being nervous Mm -hmm. and you know being self-conscious like I didn't want to make the faces and I didn't Mm want to you know you just wanted to run through the script without like or the um are you talking about choir or both of them kind of I guess I mean choir was a little different because you everyone wears the same you know like black dress and you kind of disappear into the crowd and it's more about like you know, it's more of a group thing with right. with the theater stuff. It was about like, you know, taking risks and, and things like that. And the people mm-hmm. who are really good were willing to always like take those risks, right. whereas I wanted to. But it took me a really, really long time to stop being afraid of looking stupid. Right. I it, I think I've suffered from the same sort of thing. And I've uh, it it got to a point where it pissed me off because. I can entertain my friends and and people around me pretty easily. Um, And I've always been into music and the arts, but I never did it publicly. Mm -hmm. And so it was like, it got to a point where I was like, dude, fuck this. Like, you should be doing this. Like, it's not like you want this and you're just not doing it because you're scared. So I've my first ever time playing music in front of anyone was like six months ago. Oh, really? Yeah. I'd never played before and I got super fucking hammered. Before I went on stage. (laughs) And it was not a good idea. (laughs) And I totally fucked up. I couldn't hear myself through the monitor. I lost my place so many times. But we played so loud. And we were actually like the headlining act. And I think it was because our Instagram had a lot of followers. But Mm -hmm. I think it was honestly because my girlfriend at the time when I started the band was like, she was playing bass and like we got a bunch of followers just from like creeps and stuff. Oh. (laughs) Like, so then they put us last on the bill. And I just bombed. My guitar got stolen after the show. And um, That's horrible. Yeah, but so it got to this. I mean, but the thing is now, like, I love, in a strange way, I love that kind of stuff. Like, yeah? You love getting your guitar stolen? Well, we got it back. We <laughs> okay. found the guy within 24 hours. We did. <laughs> but, um, I mean, kind of, yeah, though. Like, I enjoyed, like, the experience of, like, like it's never going to happen to me again unless it's like out of my control. Right. But this time it was in my control. I like left it somewhere. And I, I know that if I want to play music and get good at just being a musician who can perform like when he needs to perform that I'm going to have to go through a lot of stressful stuff. Right. And it, now it's exciting when something stressful happens because it's like, all right, well we got to fix it like right now. Wow. But I, I wish I had the courage to do that in high school and I just did not. Right. I was like too caught up in being bad. I think I like wanted to be bad. (laughs) Yeah. I was like the, I went to private school for like a lot of that period of time. (laughs) Oh, thank you. You've got your own team behind you. It's so great. You didn't bring me a straw. (laughs) (laughs) What a diva. (laughs) I need, oh wait, we're supposed to be phasing out straws. Oh, right. I forgot Mm, about that. All right. Um, I'm sorry. I forgot to even ask you if you want a coffee. You want to share this with me? I am okay. Thank you. Are you sure? If I have too much coffee, I will start to sweat. (laughs) 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 Like, no, seriously. I I had my morning coffee. I'm, I'm good. Thank you. That's good. I really admire your, um, like self-control and I admire uh, even over your emotions like your uh mastery over stress and (laughs) things like that oh I'm not good at it I'm just um okay with it (laughs) that's good it will acknowledging it and like stating your your like stance on the situation Mm -hmm. is the first step you know right if you say enough times like I like stress (laughs) and eventually yeah no and it's that that's exactly what it's been so far like um it it has to be it has to be that way like my life is much worse when i'm not stressing myself out surprisingly mm-hmm. it's like i'm just so stagnant right but yeah i don't know 
Oh, I was saying I'm I in high school, like I went to a private school mm-hmm. and it was like my class size was like a hundred kids. Oh my god. Yeah. Wait, why is that? In in a private school, I was in public school and we had normal size classes, like, you know, twenty people mm-hmm. or something. I thought it was supposed to be opposite. Uh, with private school? Yeah, like private school you're supposed to have like, you know, like more attention from the teachers and Right. You know. We I'm oh, I'm sorry, a hundred kids. In my graduating oh, class. Oh, I thought you yeah. meant in a classroom. No, 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 no. Sorry, sorry. That was a little confusing. But yeah, 100 kids in my graduating class. Okay. That's so way different. I was the only kid in that whole school system that had gone to public school before. Oh. So I was immediately the bad boy. And I loved it. Oh, yeah. I loved it. All the girls. They were not interested, surprisingly. Really? It was... um. They really, their thing was to get into college and, like, to make a lot of money. They had no, <laughs> they were, like, when I would do bad on a test, they would be, like, Andrew, it's okay. You'll, like, you'll get it eventually. And I'll be, like, I didn't even try. Oh, man. <laughs> it was bad. So were you actually not trying or? I was not trying for sure. And I regret it. I was doing, like, ecstasy during class, like, all oh, the time. Oh, shit. And, that doesn't yeah. sound fun. It was so fun. Oh <laughs> it was God. so much fun. <laughs> Me and my friends had a really good time. But, um... <laughs> It was it was bad. I remember this one time I was so fucked up on ecstasy, like two pills or something, and I was I forgot I had a uh, chemistry test, and I filled it out. My eyes were like wiggling so much that I couldn't like um, like see anything. Uh-huh. So I just like filled in a bunch of stuff and I turned it in. And I you know I thought I had finished the test and the teacher's like Andrew, are you sure? And I'm like yeah, I, I that's all I can do. Like sorry, I'm just I can't right now. And she was like, oh, okay. And also, I don't know how none of them knew I was on drugs because I would, like, talk to teachers. But um, so then I got the test back the next day and I got 50%. Mm -hmm. And I answered 15 out of 30 questions. So you got every question right. Yeah. And I was just like. Wow. But I was so fucked up. I didn't know that I had only answered half the test. So I was like, damn it. I Man. gotta get in that mode again. Just well, kidding. and now you now you can't handle your morning coffee. Things have changed. <laughs> no, yeah, yeah. I I I do ecstasy maybe like once a year. At really, like a festival, still like just one pill. Um, and uh, acid scares the shit out of me. Can't smoke weed anymore. I used to smoke like an eighth every two or three days. Yeah. And now, after doing acid, like I get bad anxiety when I smoke weed. Huh. Yeah. I'm real. I'm always really jealous of um. Of people who can smoke weed. I can't at all. I wish I could. I wish it made me relax, but I just can't. It, like, mm-hmm. makes everything more intense for me. I wish I could, like, smoke before bed and have, like, yeah cozy nights, but I can't. People who do that, it's like... <laughs> what? It's like a, it's like, che- like a cheat code, you know? Yeah. See, I took Valium for a little bit because I was having trouble sleeping. Really? And it was great, but then it made me feel bad. I was like, man, it, I don't like the idea of taking this every night to go to bed. Yeah. And so I just got more jealous of people that smoked weed. Mm-hmm. Uh, I've done a lot of drugs. <laughs> I um I really haven't. I, I As far as like experimenting goes, I've never done anything hallucinogenic. Oh, really? Um, no, I'm like terrified of it. it. That's the way I describe it to people. I say it's like it's um, terrifying and beautiful at the same time. People say that they have good experiences but it's like i feel like their version of a good experience for me would be a complete nightmare oh my best (laughs) best uh experiences with acid were still terrifying right even when i'm like it was super beautiful Mm -hmm. it was still horribly or like i just was so uncomfortable the whole time but where a lot of kids in um uh you're like theater and choir classes doing drugs in high school? No, none of them. Um, in high school, I was like uh, the crowd that I ran with was like very um, like straight laced. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, I my, my best friend was uh, Mormon. Okay, um, and then. I was actually kind of like a little bit more rebellious than the rest of the group. Uh, grew. That was group and crew <laughs> together. Oh, I like it. Grew. Yeah, my grew. <laughs> yeah, we grow together. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, like a lot of my a lot of my friends kind of um, were like a little judgmental of me back mm. then because what is being more bad than them? I like you know 
I would like smoke a cigarette Ooh, at a party shit. or something, you know, which yeah. which sucks. And, you know, kids are stupid and they shouldn't do that. And like my parents are going to be mad if they hear this. But like, um, you know, they're kids... going to be upset that you're in a room with me. That's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> After telling my stories, you know, I would like I I like got drunk. Mm-hmm. Um, OK. And, uh, you know, my friends just weren't in that into that stuff, which is you know, fine, because, yeah, like, kids shouldn't be doing that when they're in high school, but, like, some of them are going to, and, I, you know, when everyone got mad at me for it, it was very, like, alienating, which, you know, wasn't... You don't understand me. (laughs) Right. Yeah, yeah. Um, And then, anyway, everyone, after high school, everyone got into, like, beer pong, and, like, I wasn't into beer pong, because it's like I had already had my rebellious stage, so, you know? Well, that's the thing, they just were being... They're pointing fingers because you did it a little earlier than the rest of them. Yeah. And uh, yeah, then then they went and did it and it's just a part of growing up. Yeah. But yeah, I think that kids, it, I can't believe all the shit I was doing bef- when I was younger. Like I've, I, I was way crazier than I am now. And that's probably good because they, you can go to jail now. I can so go to jail now. Yeah. <laughs> um, but, but they tell me that like, you're, so your brain's fully developed, but not mine. Like, at 25, right. your brain's fully developed. Right. So I'm like, what the fuck was I doing with my half a brain, like, doing all these drugs and stuff? Right. It's not smart. <laughs> and now um, and now all my high school friends are pill heads, and I don't do anything. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's a that's a thing now. Um, like, definitely, like, Adderall was, a, was, like, a college thing. And, yeah. And, you know, like, even after college. And, um, you know, it's like, that shit is really brutal because for it's legal coke man yes it is and like they prescribe it to people who have like anxiety symptoms you know because a lot of that like overlaps with add Mm -hmm. and adhd and stuff you know because a lot some people like have a hard time in school or something and Mm -hmm. they struggle with that and it makes them like anxious and depressed right and then they give you set it themselves and you know meth (laughs) yeah yeah um and like i ended up um you know, like a couple summers ago, I ended up in an emergency room because I was, I had, you know, taken Adderall because like, you know, I felt like my brain wasn't making dopamine or anything. Yeah. yeah. And I took Adderall, even though I already like have major anxiety issues Mm -hmm. and had like this insane, you know, like panic attack. Like I really thought I was dying Mm -hmm. and like, um, I had the same sort of thing in Vegas, but I was doing ecstasy, and then I ended the night with Adderall. Oh God! And um, it felt like my uh, like my brain was. That getting... makes me so scared for you. Yeah, my, my <laughs> girlfriend had to drive me back from Vegas, and I remember walking up the stairs for, at our apartment when I got home, and I like couldn't move. Mm-hmm. But yeah, my brain was like it felt like it was like electrocuting itself, and I was getting like a panic attack. It's too. the worst thing, and it, you know what? It's I really, really hate that. Um, that it, it, it like people are still doing things like that yeah. you know and like it was very when i was in college it was very like glamorized yeah um oh yeah for sure mm-hmm. and i mean just like drugs in general and it's and also weirdly you know it's like i don't i don't know like i don't i, I talk about this a fair amount um and i i think that it should be talked about a lot more but i i suffer from like a lot of anxiety and depression mm-hmm. issues and i have for many years um and even in college like anxiety and depression was almost glamorized oh totally you i know? know exactly what you mean it's like i was i was a student and i was an english major and i was like an intellectual or whatever yeah. and it was like the more fucked up i got yeah. like the more you know like the scarier i looked and the more like you know like the darker the bags under my eyes were it was like the more it was like evidence that yeah. I was actually like a living human and it was in like, a way yeah like there's this line from MGMT that I like um if you are conscious you must be depressed and I think that like that's kind of mean. college yeah <laughs> but I think college kids like the more depressed they feel I think they also feel that they're depressed for a reason because right. there's like I know what's going on mm-hmm. the world sucks sort of thing and then if you don't have anxiety, you're not pushing yourself. So it's just this weird trap that college puts you in. Right. Um, did you, had you used Adderall with like success before you had your panic attack? Like I think w- that, was it good for you? I think that in a way? most people have at least, a, you know, some success with Adderall right. at first. Because <laughs> I really, really liked it. It helped me be really productive. But yeah. at a certain point, I also felt like um, 
my muscles were deteriorating. Like yeah. my, my legs felt sore always or stuff like that. And I just... At the first, when you first start taking something like that, it's like, it don't, it feels like a superpower yeah. or something yeah, like, exactly. you know, suddenly all these things you were struggling with, it's now a breeze. Mm-hmm. You, you know, feel like you feel inspired or whatever. I actually but... couldn't um, play music really with Adderall. I would rush myself too much or like mm-hmm. the guitar would hurt my hands. Right. So I, I, I eventually just stopped because I was playing music more and more. It's not a good thing. And something that I realized eventually um you know uh well, because i again it's one of these things where you sort of convince yourself that well it sucks and i shouldn't do it but also i'd be able to do all these things if i did right at some point you have to f- realize that whatever like whatever you're doing or whatever thoughts you're having or ideas or you know whatever you're capable of when you take it you're already capable of those things mm-hmm. and it's it's a right you know it's like a, an illusion i think you know? we i completely agree and i think we get upset that we can't do everything mm-hmm. but i think the thing that people need to realize is that you're not going to be able to do everything you should do the important things right and you're going to be unsatisfied anyway cuz mm-hmm. you're a human you're not going to be able to do everything you want yeah but if you do the important things you'll still feel better like and probably gradually better more and more as time goes on. Yeah. And you know what? Now that now that you say that, I actually am kind of grateful that I went through that period because, you know, I, I started doing things like that when I was really stressed about school. And, you know, it's like I had all of this pressure on me and I wasn't handling it well. Mm-hmm. And there's, you know, just a lot of other things going on. And um, I was just under, like, a tremendous amount of stress. Um, and I was looking for... Uh, a way to make that easier and then i also had like a lot of like body image issues and stuff and it makes right. you lose weight or whatever and so i got yeah. kind of caught in that trap and like i have three um, or four people people's names in my heads that like same exact story yeah and well, they're yes. all they're all <laughs> girls and the the body thing i i never i obviously can't understand from firsthand experience mm-hmm. um except for like in high school not feeling masculine enough right but um I just, I still think it's way worse for for women, the whole body thing. It's terrible. Um, and, you know, we can, like, get into how that happens. But um, <laughs> <laughs> but what I, I think what I, what I wanted to say to, like, stop talking about Adderall. Oh, okay, like, yeah. we've been talking about Adderall for a long that time. Happens. Is that yeah. when I was doing it, even when I was in school and then after I was in school and I was, like, drifting and lost and didn't know what I wanted to do with myself because, mm-hmm. like, I didn't go on to grad school because I, like, folded under the pressure. Right. Um, so but what, what, were I, you, what were you going to school for? I was an English major. Oh, okay. And I was going to be, like, an academic, like, yeah. continue on and be a professor or something. Um, but when I would, when I took Adderall, And I was supposed to, like, write my thesis. Mm -hmm. I would spend, like, 10 hours playing guitar instead. Uh, And so (laughs) in a way, it's like if I hadn't had that period, I probably I may not have, like, figured out what my actual priorities were. Like, you know, when I was feeling my like when I was had all this energy and I was having, you know, like impulses to do things. It was never to, like, sit and finish my papers right it was like it was the thing that i actually spent my time doing that i realized is what i wanted to be doing in the end so so college was kind of when you found yourself uh gravitating towards music more yeah i think so um i i was living in new york um and i was living alone a lot of the time because i had I lived in a dorm my freshman year and then the year after that Rado and I moved in together okay and then like a month or something after we signed our lease Mm -hmm. he got a record deal and started touring and was gone for like months at a time okay um and so I was how did you guys meet uh in high school oh okay you went to this um over here in what's it called agora high school agora high school that's funny so how you both went to college in new york then he's um he is a little bit older than me so i was a senior the first year that he moved to new york to go to film school okay um and then after I graduated, I applied to a bunch of schools in New York, not just because he was there. Like, I'd always wanted to go to school in New York. Yeah, it's a it great place. It was just place. for different reasons when I was younger because, like, 
when I was younger, I was like, I'm going to be yeah. like a Dina Menzel on Broadway yeah. or something. And then by the time I finished high school, I was really into the idea of being a writer. Mm. Um, and mm-hmm. I wanted to go be like a like writer poet yeah. in New York. <laughs> That's the place to be, man. Mm-hmm. Some uh, Patti Smith. Oh, I actually didn't even know about Patty Smith until like this last year. Her well, I didn't ever research her until like this last year, and I've read all her books now, and it makes me cry. Yeah, I, she's such a silly, beautiful human. Incredible, you know I mean? incredible. Um, I heard I this is embarrassing, but I actually think I'm very lucky. I somehow missed out on hearing horses mm-hmm. until. Act, like actually six months ago right and it's one of those things where if you, i had heard it in high school i would have hated it no i would have freaked out oh um because it's what? like the best thing i've ever heard oh, well, but yeah. i got to have one of those experiences like you know the way when you hear something that changes your life when you're a teenager yeah. how that feels mm-hmm. i haven't had that in a long time because you know i'm just a little i'm like older and i'm a little bit more Aware like jaded more, or whatever yeah. but then i heard this record and i had that like teenage experience yeah, again yeah. and it was like i don't know i just hadn't had that in so long yeah um i actually got that with um i believe a buddy of yours um so mgmt was like the first thing for me i was like <laughs> smoking weed in my room and like blasting mgmt and i just it was that was it made me feel young and great right and then um it happened again in 2016 i went to go to the echo and i saw diane coffee sean (laughs) and and i actually was talking to him a little bit in the pizza place right next door to that two Um, boots right i don't know what wait wait what where was he playing the echo the echo two boots it's called two boots this guy came in off the street and told me he was gonna stab me because i didn't have any change to give him oh my god and then like Sean had turned around and I knew who he was because I was into his his records Mm -hmm. but it was the first time seeing him live and in person being in the same place and he was like oh what was up with that guy (laughs) and so we talked for a little bit and he was just like the nicest person ever but his music made me um like fall in love again really yeah I like I was too into like avant-garde stuff Mm -hmm. you know and like taking everything really really seriously and then around the time 2016 when I was listening to Diane Coffee or first got into it, it like I was able to fall in love with like cliche things again. Uh-huh. Which I I hope he doesn't take offense to that. <laughs> I think that he's gonna... I'm not talking that about his music as being cliche. I think it's really experimental and fun and beautiful. But it I just mean that his music like let me kind of go back into being a kid and letting yeah. myself fall in love with things easier. Sean has a very youthful spirit and i think that that comes through in his music yeah it's um he's i don't he's like the um most like little kid adult i've ever met i've interacted (laughs) with him twice and he's just a a beautiful human being yes i agree he's um we've been friends for a very very long time and he actually lived with me in that apartment for a little while oh cool Mm -hmm. awesome Um, so that apartment in New York, so you had just, um, signed a lease with Rado. He goes off and gets a record deal. (laughs) What are... I thought that was so cool and also so rude. (laughs) Oh, really? (laughs) Yeah. So... I'm joking. I was very supportive of it, but it was very difficult for me. I'm sure, yeah. Um, I'm, I'm also like, I mean, we'd been together for many years already, Mm -hmm. um, and I didn't really have that many friends in New York, um, I, I'd left all my friends in California, obviously. Right. Um, I was in my first year of college. I was a communications major, mm-hmm. um, because my dad read a pamphlet mm-hmm. <laughs> that said that that was <laughs> my dad read a pamphlet. <laughs> yeah. So I was in com arts, um, and I wasn't enjoying it. Um, and I wasn't really connecting with that many people. And so, and my, uh, I don't, my first year in college was not particularly social. Yeah. And um, and then the second year that I was there was, you know, we moved in together. Things um, are looking up. Things are looking <laughs> up. And I'm not used to spending time by myself. Like, I have a sister. Mm-hmm. I am a. I am not an, like, Rado's an only child, but I am a very, like, naturally codependent person. Me too. I have a huge family. Yeah. Um, like, I talk to my mom nine times a day, which is, it's not me calling her nine times a day. <laughs> she yeah. calls me, but that's just how my you family's answer always nine been. nine times. Though. Yeah. And I always have something to talk to her about. Yeah. <laughs> She's, like, my best friend. That's awesome. Um, but, so, I'm not, 
I'm not used to um, being alone. Mm -hmm. And I'm also, I had also come out of a situation where my, like in high school, I developed all these friend groups around scenes, you know, like I was in the theater, you know, world or like I was in choir class or I was on Mm -hmm. the improv team or something. It was like, I'm on this team. These are my friends. Right. And so in college, it's like you kind of get thrown into this atmosphere where it's not as um, clear cut how you're going to meet people. And especially in New York, there's no campus. And so I was living all the way downtown. My school was uptown. A lot of people still lived in dorms. And so I was just in this apartment um, by myself, uh, not happy yeah. With a program, I switched over into the English program, which was very small, and all the kids were older than me. Mm-hmm. Um, and suddenly, I just, I, like, didn't know what to do with myself. Right. Yeah. Um, I've been in those situations. Yeah. They're it was hard. hard. <laughs> They're super hard. So, a um, little bit of backstory. So, what college was this? Marymount, Mary, Marymount Manhattan College. Marymount Manhattan. And... Um, I'm assuming people know because I know Foxygen and I'm assuming that's the record deal that Rito mm-hmm. got. Yeah. Yeah. But uh, if whoever's listening doesn't know what the fuck we're talking about, <laughs> uh, Rito's in a band called Foxygen. Very great band. And uh, that's the record deal we're talking about. Mm-hmm. So that was his, that, that was for, uh, was that for Take the Kids Off Broadway or was that? that yeah. That record was already made and they released it. Okay. Okay. So then he's, he's touring that record or was or a different one i mean it was always sort of they were always like as a band they were always on to the next thing whatever they were doing and so they've never until the last tour that we did where we um we only played hang their newest record all the way through Mm -hmm. but we played a couple other songs like the hits um as well but in up until that point um a lot of their live show was sort of like um, an amalgamation it's it was never right. just like we're touring just this record album. okay so you're in the apartment you don't know what the fuck to do with yourself <laughs> because being lonely is hard and not fun and i was so far from my family and everything it's right. just a it was like a shit show so what <laughs> happens next um like what do you mean <laughs> like what you what did you end up doing with yourself or what like moves your story on i for a couple years because i moved into the english program because um I took a lit theory class as an elective mm-hmm. and um, and I was really good at it. Mm-hmm. And my professor like pulled me aside and was like, I like would really like to encourage you to switch into the program. Mm-hmm. So I got like scouted sort of um, and I was very flattered by that because <laughs> I was looking for some kind of validation somewhere. Yeah, yeah. And, um, sure. and I also loved it. You know, it's i was i was always kind of like i had writerly ambitions yeah you know i had the reason i decided to go to college was because my english teacher in high school had told me that um that i should and that he thought i would be a writer and so i thought about it and i switched into the program and then for a couple of years i like threw myself into that really really hard like Mm -hmm. um like my whole identity was wrapped around being a legit it, writer. Like yeah, like a writer of being a being a like literary theory student. Okay. Um that was kind of that was my thing. That's where I got really in, invested and really interested mm-hmm. was like the, you know, the theoretical studies. Right. Um which is crazy and endless. <laughs> and endless and yeah. like I spent my entire senior year writing like a 30-page paper on metaphors. Yep. Um, and <laughs> yep. like, <laughs> sounds about right. I mean, I really got lost in that shit. Um, I love. I mean, I love stuff like that. But mm-hmm. um, part of me always wanted to be a writer as well. But mm-hmm. I just, I, I don't know if I could take those steps to, to you know, write a thirty-page paper about metaphors. That sounds intense. I it it was very intense. Did and... you love it when you were doing it though, or was this? Oh, I like... loved it. Oh, okay, good. I loved it, but it was like painful. Yeah, you know. It, I mean, again, it's I, the reason why I didn't pursue it. You know, beyond 
you know, just having like a nervous breakdown Mm -hmm. was that as much as I liked doing it and I really did and my it was like really my whole identity, it wasn't good for me, Mm -hmm. you know, and at some point I figured I had to like decide do I want to continue doing things because I like them and I'm good at it, but it like undoes me Mm -hmm. or do I need to find somewhere else to put myself? It's a hard question for what were you? 21 22 yeah <laughs> fuck yeah i i usually answer those questions wrong when i'm asking right. well i did for a long time which is you know why i started taking Adderall. yeah okay yeah. yeah because i mean i was just really really miserable and i was trying to fight that back in any way that i could yeah and again it's like i mean not any way that i could because i kept going into like my school nurse or whatever with you know just completely falling apart like not sleeping for a week Mm -hmm. you know i was like i'd go in like convinced that i had like a throat infection Mm -hmm. or something and then i was like very very sick and i'd go in and they'd make me fill out like a suicide you know like i will not yeah or one of those like checklists where they decide whether or not you're a high risk and then they would send me to the counselor what is that i don't i've never it's like a it's like a um like a questionnaire Uh and it asks you things like um, you know, I, I don't actually remember if it was like a, like strongly disagree to strongly mm-hmm. agree format or something, but it asks you a bunch of questions about, you know, like your yeah. state of mind basically. And that feels hard to answer, honestly. Nobody ever does. Yeah. So I'm like, they, they probably just like, if you put like uh, slightly agree they're like okay they disagree <laughs> yeah like what are you supposed to do like one of the questions is like do you ever have like suicidal ideation and i'm like well i can imagine it <laughs> <laughs> yeah <laughs> like, like mildly agree yeah. <laughs> like um like if i got hit by a car tomorrow i wouldn't have to pay my taxes hmm. right but yeah um so yeah i was having a hard time and it was taking a an extreme like um mental and physical toll on me mm-hmm. um and like I'd had a I'd had a counselor like prescribe me antidepressants at one point and I was still I didn't under- know counselors could do that I I, I don't know it's like a maybe a school a school psychiatrist yeah crazy um and I didn't take them because <laughs> I didn't want to be on antidepressants which is stupid and I yeah. am on them now and yeah. I'm very pro uh antidepressant okay. if you need them <laughs> <laughs> right um yeah but i i know that that feeling i've i've had it in the past where i'm like i can help myself mm-hmm. i will fix it myself mm-hmm. i'm still kind of in that but uh i actually have helped myself because i've changed my <laughs> drug use <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> to, to almost none right which makes my uh sanity much better i uh, imagine <laughs> yeah but um so you get prescribed all this stuff, but you're not taking it. I didn't want to. I was just like, it's like I don't want to take your drugs, which yeah. is no. I get what a you're stupid saying. Stupid stigma. I, I understand that for sure. It's like mm-hmm. almost admitting something's wrong with you too. In yeah, a way, which I didn't want sucks. anyone to tell me there was something going on, like there was something wrong going on with me. I wanted someone to sympathize with all the things that were happening to me. Right. Which is, you know, it, mm-hmm. I mean, I, I was in. I was under a lot of stress and there were definitely things going on in my life at that time, Mm -hmm. which were causing me a great deal of stress and anxiety. Um, But, you know, I'm also just, I, you know, I have depression issues and Mm -hmm. high, high anxiety. Um, And, you know, again, it's like, I I, I hear people use um, this example a lot and I do think that it's a, a good one. It's like, if you're diabetic, people don't tell you not to take your insulin you know right, right yeah. and it's the same thing and unfortunately um mental health is still very stigmatized uh, i i completely agree and i feel really badly about something in the past because oh shit no i can't say this one <laughs> um i will tell you after <laughs> okay no i can say this so i found out that somebody very close to me was was taking antidepressants and mm-hmm. i was young and naive and i'll blame it on that but it's wrong i'm telling you this is wrong Mm -hmm. um admitting that admitting something that you have learned is never bad well i just feel so (laughs) badly now because i don't know if it it 
negatively affected this person's life, but mm-hmm. I found out they were on antidepressants while I was um, looking for like medicine or something. And I confronted them about it. I was like 14 and I was mad at them because I thought that they didn't need it and that they just need to work harder. Right. And I told them these things, which is not a great thing to tell somebody who's got depression. Right. And probably doesn't want people to know that they're on antidepressants. At this time, I don't think the person wanted... I mean, I'm not using their name because I still don't mm-hmm. think they want them to know. But um, I just feel bad because I don't know how they're doing now. But I was fucking stupid, you know? And There's a lot of... There's a lot of... um. Uh, misinformation about it and it's you know and again I just did it's, not understand it yeah for sure yeah and, I, and it's different for everybody you know it's like there are a lot of things again it's not like I take a pill and I feel happy every day right you know it's yeah. like it takes a lot of like a lot of hard work and discipline and mindfulness and you know a lot of I have a lot of really really shitty days yeah, yeah. Um, and again it's like I, it, it's all it's all chemical. Everything that yeah. you do is chemical. If you go for a run, yep. it, it makes chemicals in your brain. Or if you like eat a bunch of chocolate or something, it makes mm-hmm. chemicals in your brain. And it's you know everything you do, including take med- taking medication, it all affects those levels, and it all affects the way you perceive yourself and perceive the world. Mm-hmm. And um, I don't know. I think that. I just think I think it's good that more people are starting to understand that um, that everybody's needs are different. Yeah, I agree. And I think that mental health has been a subject of uh, conversation more often than I've seen it be in the past, Mm -hmm. which is nice. But so you you're doing this whole thing, but uh, something must change to bring you back to California or what's like what what gets you out of the whole college thing? Um. I, I mean, it was sort of like a, like, I had to get out of there. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Like it was, it was enough was enough. I was, I was like in, in danger of like, of doing like harm to myself. Okay. It actually got to that point for you. I, well, I mean, I was, I was not taking care of myself. I was, I was very isolated. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, and I was just in this very dark place that kept getting darker right. and I needed to come home and I needed the support system of my family. And, um, I mean, I just, I needed a change of, I just needed to change my entire life because I had gotten myself into a position that I didn't know how to get out of. Right. Um, yeah, the, that's, I, I don't say this to downplay anything you're saying, but I feel like I'm saying it because I think that it's an issue with a lot like our youth where this happens a lot. Mm -hmm. And we put like kids who are just starting to live life like in these positions and they they sometimes unfortunately feel that you've made a decision. You have to stick with it. Right. And. Unfortunately, with college in particular, unfortunately, that is often, I mean, it's a financial situation as well. Right. You know, if I'm starting my senior year and I'm already starting to feel very, very shaky, Mm -hmm. but it's like, I'm like three quarters of the way to my my very expensive degree. Right. You know, I have to do this. I heard somebody say once that it felt like they were paying to be in prison because it was (laughs) just a, it wasn't like beneficial for them at a certain point. Right. I mean, I'm also very, I think that my, that going to school really shaped me in a lot of ways. Um, I'm very grateful for my time there. And, you know, my professors were incredible people. Mm. Um, I mean, it it was some of the most, it it, those, it was the most important time in my life in a lot of ways. Yeah. Um, It's, and it's sad to me that I couldn't figure out a way to make it through more gracefully. Um, I I have a lot of, you know, I still have a lot of regrets about not going to grad school. And, Mm -hmm. you know, I had a bunch of, I had some papers that I was supposed to like be prepping for, um, for like publish or whatever. Mm -hmm. And I just like, I remember sending them in, uh, you know, in, in their final drafts and just like having 
all these weird like page breaks where I just insert notes like this part is supposed to be finished. I'm really sorry. I'm really <laughs> sorry. Yeah. You know, like in the document. Wow. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, I mean, I was really losing it. Yeah. You, you were just hanging on. Yeah. And so, I mean, and I, I still feel like that part of me um, is like kind of hanging out and chilling for a time when I'm ready to get back to it. Right. You know, I was just going to say that to you. Like, I think that it's a beautiful thing when people can get into that later on in their life and mm-hmm. to use. I know Patty Smith had success when she was younger, but she um, is somebody that I love to read about because she kept adventuring and like doing things she forgot to do when she was younger and she did them later in life and she had means by then but it's still that that doesn't matter the point is you can go back and like fulfill your yourself later on like just because it you you weren't ready mentally then doesn't mean you're not going to be ready mentally later right and um you do you think you want to pursue writing later on in your life I'm saying who knows for now because I mean like yes and I again it's like writing is is a very it's a big part of what I do now Mm -hmm. um right you know (laughs) that's like yeah uh and that's how my dad justifies my my degree he says well your English degree is how you write songs (laughs) yeah and you know and it's really true it's it is true in some ways um and uh I do write um, I would assume that your your music has more um, of a storyline, or you know, than than maybe most people who write songs because of your English de- degree. You're probably more thoughtful about intent and um, like what you want to say than, maybe. than maybe most people. I don't know, but art's weird. <laughs> yeah, art art is who knows. You could like say one word in a song. And I don't claim like, to be more deep. anything than anybody. <laughs> it's true. Um. Uh, but it it is. I think that I it's. I definitely have a little bit of a of a um, like. I think my mom made fun of me for. I think I used the word like thus or something in a song. Oh, and she's <laughs> my, like, "What the fuck?" <laughs> yeah, my mom thought that was weird. Um, but yeah, it's. Uh, I, I was when I was in school. I was also like a. I was a creative writing minor, and mm-hmm. I was. Um, like very involved in the like poetry scene over there, mm-hmm. and um, have you published any of your poetry? No, you no. Well, I the thing about that is that when I was over there, it's like the poet. It, it when when you present yourself as being a poet, or like you publish a poem or something, or you write a poem or workshop poem or something like that, and people have a really really hard time with like narrative distance or something and so mm-hmm. and especially with poetry which you know some of my favorite poets are um confessional poets mm-hmm. and i always felt like a little too like under the microscope or something mm-hmm. when i did mm-hmm. that and so when i started doing what i was doing there but now i'm writing songs it's like i feel like i'm not it's not as like close in right. a way and it's it's far enough away from me that i can like sing a song and have like have fun when i do it right. instead of feeling like you're i'm just, exposing myself you're performing your poetry in a way that allows um yeah some some distance between the words and yourself right um but while still being revealing and meaning something to you yeah yeah I mean, maybe I'd be writing the same thing if it was a if it was a poem or a song, right. maybe. And I mean, of course, you know the formats are different. And oh. but, um, but when you play a song, it's like people don't, you know. It's like if I if I write a song and it's sort of like a like a sad breakup song or something, people don't assume that I'm right. like in the middle of like a breakup. It's or, just a song. It's yeah. a, it's a song that I wrote. Yeah. It's funny, I performed two nights ago at Lot 1 in L.A., and I told you before, but I haven't mentioned this on my podcast yet, that it was my first time, just me and guitar. And um, I have this one song that people kept complimenting me on after, which was really nice. I love when that happens, but it's the song I like the least because I tried the least on it. (laughs) My friend, she writes music that is so confessional to the point where it's like, 
it's not hiding anything and it's like just simple like you said this and I felt this way you know and I was like fuck it I'm gonna write a song like that and so I tried to and now like that's a song that people point out to me and I'm like I hate that song really I like because it I bet it's really good <laughs> it's <laughs> well here's the thing it's like I think it's the reason why like pop music is pop music mm-hmm. it's because it's uni- or it's more universally um People can connect with it easier. Yeah. Like a wider group of people can connect with music, pop music. And I think a wider group of people feel the way that I I sang in the song. But for right. me, it's so unpoetic. It's just me being like, it's not poetic <laughs> like <laughs> to me at all. But, but it's Yeah, just... but maybe it is. Maybe it is in that way. <laughs> maybe, whatever art is like so you can we'll say. listen to it and we'll talk about it okay, okay, okay. <laughs> we'll workshop <laughs> oh my gosh please no um, <laughs> that was so annoying i'm sorry <laughs> no, 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 no 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 it's funny it's more funny than anything but so you're um did you come back home did you move back home yeah for, um... i moved home the week i graduated oh okay you're like fuck this place uh-huh <laughs> yeah i was out well, you graduated, so you like, you, you must feel some pride in that. Well, yeah, I, I mean, I definitely, and I graduated like I sound like I was like failing. I did really well. Oh, okay, cool. Um, I, I got really good grades. It's just that I didn't sleep for an entire school year. You succeeded um, at one thing, but were failing at taking care of yourself. Yeah, really badly. Okay. Um, and like all my teachers were really scared for me <laughs> and like they kept like... It's not funny. I'm so sorry. No, it is funny at this point. Like I'm thinking back and it's just like I really hope if there's anything that I could ever say to help anyone is like don't do that. <laughs> don't do that. <laughs> don't do that. Yeah. Um, <laughs> don't do what I did. Yeah. My, my professors were... Th- they were really worried about me and I was so focused on them like finding out that I was like a fraud oh, or something that I didn't for you. yeah I didn't care that anyone wanted to help me I was just trying to like hide it mm-hmm. and I wasn't doing a good job mm-hmm. um I remember the worst thing that ever happened to me my most like horrible memory is I was I I w- was re- like I had a paper that was you know there was one other girl in my program and we were receiving honors in the major and I was supposed to give a 15 minute presentation Mm -hmm. on the work I was doing. And I stayed up for like, like a week freaking out about it. Mm -hmm. It's like, I knew what I was talking about. I knew what my paper was about, but I pro but I was so frantic and so manic. And I put together in like the morning of it, I got up at like three in the morning and started making this PowerPoint that was just completely incoherent. And it was Mm -hmm. like 90 pages. And then I got (laughs) up in front of the entire department. And I also had like green ish hair at this point because I like panicked and dyed my hair green. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Um, And I'm standing up. I've got like, like these crazy bags under my eyes, and there's a picture of me, and I look like I'm straining so hard to smile. And I get up and I start talking, and it it's brought to my attention after this happens. I'm standing up by a wooden podium, mm-hmm. and the entire time I am taking, I have my thumbnail, and I am ripping it apart oh, with my thumbnail my because yeah. I am so nervous and yeah. I talk for like 45 minutes oh, no. just going on and on and on and the whole department is like holding on to their seats like <laughs> Do you think she has a gun? Do you think she so, has a gun? Yeah, so, well, no, that is horrifying. That's not not funny to say. No, I'm just, I mean, it is because um, you did not have a gun. No, no, I was, but I was like, I, I mean. You're- breaking in front of them yeah and it was so public <laughs> Malfunctioning. And, it, and i was supposed to be like receiving honors for it and at the end of it they were like so your paper is about um what <laughs> texts <laughs> like yeah. and you're like fuck yeah and, do you want me to do it again i can go up there again oh my god it was such a nightmare and but that was like my whole semester and i don't know it's like if i if i could do it over again i would have just like t- you know taken all of the concerned looks as like a cue to like stop doing what i was doing yeah it wasn't working slow down and recuperate a little bit or like mm-hmm. just reevaluate the things you're deciding to mm-hmm. do with yourself mm-hmm. i mean it's easier said than done and now that you're past it it's 
you know, you're able to look at it with uh, open eyes. But so you go back home Mm -hmm. and do you immediately start to feel better? No. No. Okay. No. <laughs> there, I mean, all of, I just had so much like guilt and shame about oh, it. Mm-hmm. Um, and I also didn't know what to do with myself. Were your parents upset that you didn't do your... No, they were very proud of me. Okay. Like I got through it and everyone was really worried okay, about supportive me. supportive family. Okay. Very supportive. Good. Um, I came home and again, it's like I was touring with Rado's band and, you know, like I've always... I've always been involved in in his stuff mm-hmm. and um and so I was able to like escape my own situation for periods of time mm-hmm. and I really loved doing it you know so, like those tours were you know so the most fun I've ever had in my life right. but then we would come off tour and that's the thing about tour people talk about um like post tour blues mm-hmm. or whatever and it's very real because you have this life um and it, it's like this whole world and uh, all musicians share it. Like mm-hmm. they all like the tour life or whatever. Mm-hmm. And then you come home and it's like, okay. Nothing's happening. Yeah. Like, like, what do I do? Yeah. And I had just thrown away my entire life as far as I was concerned. Right. Um, Which is a very fun thing to do. And most people are very willing to throw away their lives when they're like, hey, do you want to go on tour for Mm -hmm. a month they're like oh yeah fuck everything else that Mm -hmm. sounds great (laughs) you know and i mean in ways it was it was like because in my mind it was much more glamorous than what i was doing um and i needed to get away from it and i wanted to feel like i was making moves towards something Mm -hmm. but then i would come home and it was like okay well along with throwing that life away i kind of threw my identity away like you know and i didn't want to just be like you know, I've never just wanted to be an accessory to someone else's life. Right. Yeah. I've um, dealt with that many times mm-hmm. on both ends of it. Somebody felt like they were an accessory to mine and then I felt like I was an accessory it to happens. theirs. It um, Somebody said to me once that if you're happy with yourself, you'll be happy wherever you are. Mm-hmm. And if you think that running away to somewhere else is going to solve your problems, you don't realize like you're carrying them with you. you right. Know? And... Um, it's so true, and it's it's a simple thing people know, but it's so hard to make change in your life. Mm-hmm. And um, so you you do the tour thing, and you come back, and like what when what happens for you where things start to get better? Because I'm assuming things get better for you, uh, because I'm sitting here <laughs> and you seem well adjusted and happy. I'm doing really well right now. Okay, so um, what. Well, so what happened when I when I left in between tours, we were living in this house in the valley and Rado was um, he produces mm-hmm. as well. And so he was taking on these other projects and, you know, there were um, bands at the house all the time. And um, I had nothing to do. I, had you know, dropped off the face of the planet. You know, mm-hmm. I didn't have my friends out here anymore because everyone mm-hmm. out, from high school had moved on to other things. Um, I mean, there's still some people out here and, um, I reconnected with a lot of people, but for the most part, like my life before college was obliterated and my life in college was obliterated. Yeah. Um, and I was alone a lot and I, and like Rado was there, but he was like out in the garage studio, right. like working on records. And what I found myself doing was... Um, we had a piano in the house and I'd never had a piano before. Mm. Um, I'd never taken any music lessons. I was, you know, I, I knew how to play some chords on guitar just because, um, you know, when I was in school or whatever, I would sit and I would like learn how to play like a Neil Young song or something like that, you know, and I, I really liked doing that. And I wrote my first song in college actually. Um, uh, and, uh, and so I would, while Rado was busy all day, I would sit inside and, um, and like plunk out chords mm-hmm. on the piano like this. Yeah. And, um, and in a couple of months over that summer, I just started writing like all of these songs. Yeah. Um, and, uh, music is a great, um, therapy tool. Mm-hmm. It's like it. It allows you to say things that maybe you didn't know 
needed to be said right through sounds not so much words as well like pianos like you said we were talking about haunting piano and like anastasia and that whole soundtrack Mm -hmm. thing but like that's what piano does for me like piano makes me go really deep musically Mm -hmm. even when i'm not singing and it like brings out some really dark but like beautiful things right and it feels like i just like talk to a therapist like after playing piano right so you're writing all these songs and um so you're learning the like new chords as you're going and just it sounds so awesome i love <laughs> i love piano and so does, is this your inspiration for like putting together shows and and more music of your own to play out well i mean that's definitely how i started because up until that time i had always thought about myself as like an academic Mm -hmm. or like a Uh, writer mm -hmm. um i tried writing i did had like a short stint writing um like bios and press releases for bands Mm -hmm. and stuff but i was having like not as satisfying it wasn't just that it was like ptsd like i would break down and go into like finals mode oh and i would just completely lose it and it was stay up for a week and like rado i i just recently wrote one for a friend and it was like it wasn't as bad as it could have been Mm -hmm. but rado recently told me like if he if his opinion matters his opinion is that i should never do that again oh my god (laughs) wow so (laughs) If my opinion matters, my opinion is <laughs> he knows never I'm gonna do whatever do I'm gonna do, right. but like that he's right. I shouldn't, I shouldn't, um, I shouldn't drink red wine, and I shouldn't. Oh um, boy, <laughs> I shouldn't write press releases. Red wine, huh? <laughs> yeah. Um, and so, uh, yeah, I started writing all these songs, and like Rada would come inside, and I, you know, I'd get be kind of shy, and I'd be like. Like I, I remember, like I wrote something. I think it's like kind of good mm-hmm. or something. And he was like very supportive. He was, yeah. you know, definitely um, pushing me in that direction because I was finding something to do with myself. Yeah. Um, and I was writing so much, and I was doing it every day. And it's yeah. like, and then I would, you know, maybe one day I like take an Adderall and <laughs> yeah. I spend like, yeah. you know, ten hours like, f- like I just invented a chord or something. Right. You know, I love that like feeling, yeah. And I was getting excited about something again. And at that point, it was like I had to decide whether I was wasting time or not. You know, like, am I wasting time not getting like not searching for like a, you know, like a teaching job or like a like a program or, you know, some kind of um, like graduate school thing? Am I like am I like? just putting my life off or am I working on something now? Right. And I, it took me a long time to get here because, um, I'd never thought of myself that way. Mm -hmm. I'd always thought of myself as being involved in other people's things. And a lot of people looked at me that way too. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know, there were a lot of very, there were some like discouraging voices Mm -hmm. in my life that, definitely made me feel like pursuing any kind of music especially since i was so late to the game and untrained i feel exactly the same mm -hmm. way and it was like there was like a lot of doubt and like uh you know my first couple of shows were probably like a little scary you know like in the way where the audience is kind of scared for you (laughs) because i you know it's like my my reaction to you know um to like pressure is a a lot of the time it's like to fold like inward Mm -hmm. you know um but i no matter how many times i like broke down you know and like told myself like oh i'm just like wasting my life this Mm -hmm. is just me just wasting time i'm wasting time and my life is going nowhere i would always keep coming back to it yeah and that's always how i found myself spending my time and when i would like write a song or something i would that sense of like i'm doing the right thing would come back yeah you know yeah totally i i came to the same conclusion i call it like a quarter life crisis <laughs> where i was like the same thing i had to decide should i be spending time because i was thinking about um training to be a firefighter like less than like how many push-ups can you do quite a lot actually oh my god but i <laughs> i don't have a lot to push up but um but i was thinking about training and like actually working towards doing that and i was just trying to like really figure out what to do with myself to make money to like be okay Mm -hmm. you know and then i realized everything the same thing just like 
would fall apart that I had planned and I would find myself with music. Mm -hmm. And I got to a point where I was like, well, I think I really want to do this. So I might as well do it harder. Right. (laughs) You know, and it's scary because I'm sure you know, but anytime, I mean, I'm sure even Rado knows, like, um, even though he's in a band that's well known and loved, I bet when he meets people and he tells them like what he does, they're like, really? Like, is that, (laughs) how is that? Like, are you secure? Like most of his, um, like extended family for a long time like really was not sure what his job was yeah well this is what i mean it's like it it feels almost as if like oh am i not doing something right Right. like is this bad that i'm spending my time doing this but it's not if you're trying to make progress right and um i'm glad that you found that it uh i also really want to see you play like i'm gonna be playing at the echo um, I could tell you it's in June. <laughs> I think it's like June 21st or 22nd. Okay. Um, so I'm going to be playing in LA again very soon. Awesome. And I'm going to send you a personal invite. <laughs> oh, great. <laughs> I will be there. Mm-hmm. I'll be there. Um, and I'm playing with a full band now too, which is amazing. Ooh, nice. Yeah. That's, um, I've I got this, this girl, Jenna Projansky playing on bass and another girl, Lucy Arnell playing guitar. And right now Rado's drumming and he's a really like weirdly good drummer um Mm -hmm. for like not being a drummer Um, i'm always envious of good drummers he's he he had to work there believe me i listened to a lot of drumming yeah (laughs) um but uh he's really good um and our show is like really fun right Mm -hmm. now which is exciting because again i played a lot of shows like by myself Mm -hmm. or um you know one time rado and i did this really funny show where we both played acoustic guitar mm. and um cool you know that was it but this is my favorite iteration of the band for sure awesome you know it's funny i totally had forgotten i think the first time i because i think the first time i ever actually saw you like the uh what do you call that i'm looking for a word that it's that's failing me but anyway <laughs> so like right when instagram first started doing live I think I saw you and Rada was giving you a drum lesson. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so I think that's the first time I ever saw you. Um, I have a, I stand by this. I think that I am a naturally very gifted drummer. I've just mm-hmm. never drummed. Oh, that's um, awesome. I've like, be an awesome thing like if I sit, like I, like I'm, I suck. Mm-hmm. I can't Me play too. drums. But Neither. in theory, I think I'm really talented. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> I, don't I don't understand how there's any theory to it's bring It's complicated. To that. Okay. Okay. <laughs> you you have a special connection to drumming. Yes. That is yet to um come like to if, fruition. If I tried. <laughs> if I, yeah. Oh my god, that's how I feel with everything. Mm-hmm. And then it makes me feel vain. But um yeah, so first of all, I want to say thanks for letting me do this and bring my little studio to your big studio. Yeah, thanks for traveling. Yeah, I love traveling. <laughs> I I was so jealous that my friend's band came into town and they're on tour right now. I was like, I'm going to follow you up to Isla Vista. <laughs> and then I was like, oh, I can't. I got to do this podcast in the morning. <laughs> but like I was thinking, I was trying to plan it out. I was like, I can make it back. I can make it back. <laughs> right. But um, I love staying active. Like I have to. And um, so far I've only met wonderful people like yourself and now all my friends like just talk about music and stuff and I've kind of found a place that's more comfortable uh through doing the podcast but yeah thank you for like agreeing to do it it's such an awkward thing I always imagine like what that's like like somebody gets a message from me and they're like hey want to talk for an hour (laughs) it's like I mean that's what I'm asking and it's what can I set up a camera in front of your face for an hour (laughs) And um, thanks for being one of the brave ones. Thank you for having me. This is very enjoyable. Long form interviews are better. Did we do like? Did we do it right? <laughs> what do you mean? I don't know. <laughs> what do you mean? Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. I, don't know. I mean, it was. It's all about you. That's the, the, okay. the thing. So if unless you're lying to me about no, everything. I'm not. I'm just. You know, it's just like, did we talk about? the right anything anyone wants to listen to see that's the thing is like i i don't know and um i don't know what people want to hear but i i try to form the conversation towards things that i would want to hear Mm -hmm. and um 
I uh You have a very soothing voice, by the way. <laughs> Thank you. It's very smooth. Thank you. That's awesome <laughs> because <laughs> this is what I do. <laughs> so right. I'm, I hope it I hope it works out. But um yeah, I don't know what people want to hear, but when I reached out to you, I um and I think this might be something interesting to talk about mm -hmm. real quick. It's like um Actually, I don't know if you need to go anywhere or anything. Mm -mm. Okay, then I won't worry about it. I told my mom I'd come over later this afternoon and help her throw her clothes away. <laughs> okay. <laughs> you are a great daughter. I would tell my mom I would give an excuse, but <laughs> I'm a bad son. Um, but so when I first had messaged you, I had no idea that you were mar married to Rado. Mm -hmm. And then when I found that out, it was after you agreed to do the podcast, and I felt very strongly about n making sure that you understood that I wasn't um, making sure that you knew that I wanted to talk to you. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? And do you get? I don't know what to call them—not creeps, but maybe a lot of people with like networkers. Ill, yeah, networkers. <laughs> do you get that a lot? Um, yes, and I mean, yeah, I think. Like, yeah, there's always going to be people that are more interested in who you're connected to than who you are. Right. Um, and, uh, you know, again, that's always – it's something that I, um, like, understand. And also, it's like I love being associated with him. And, like, you know, we work on a sure. lot of my – on my music together and he's, like – my favorite partner yeah um but of course you're married yeah to him. <laughs> he's my, you know it's uh but like it's important to me that people know that i do my own things like right for a long time whenever i would tell someone like oh i'm playing a show or i made an album or something like that mm -hmm. the first thing people want to ask me is so like Rado writes your songs and you really? sing them. Or they say that. Yeah, that's fucking rude. Um, yeah, it really fucking that's... is. <laughs> and it's like, no, there's no way you could be telling this to friends, and that's how they're reacting. Um, not my, not my friends so much. Um, just trying to promote things. No, I mean, I, I like I had I had one guy reach out to me and he like wanted to like talk to me about my music or something, and I went mm -hmm. and I met him, and it's like. All he wanted to know was like if he could come see inside Rado's studio. Really? And I was just like, like, you yeah. know, please. <laughs> you could like tell instantly that this guy was about something else. Yeah, and I and the th most people are not. Most people that I have that I have met, like if I talk to someone at a show or something, mm -hmm. people who are still who are like going out to see live music and seeing these shows are like nice, cool people. I'm glad and that's the experience you've had. Really? I have not had that experience with this podcast which blows my mind because it's not a very big podcast and i've met some nefarious people really is that a word yes okay yes it is <laughs> i was like i've never used that I'm, word it's usually i think it's usually followed by activity ne nefarious activity but you mm. know what a person can probably be nefarious i'm not i just made it a thing <laughs> i don't know um so what's up with this guy that you met i don't even remember what his name Oh, well, um, I, oh, I'm not trying to like out him. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No. Um. No. Of course not. But it, it's just like it was just such a random thing. And he um, was really pushing the fact that he wanted to. Come. It was just very clear as soon as I met him that he did not think that I was that I like did anything. He and wasn't I, taking he you was, seriously. And, as a... No, and he wasn't interested in talking to me or you know, and so. Bummer. Again, and I have had experiences like that. I've had people sort of, um, you know, like talk to me as if I expect some kind of like nepotism or something like that. Like I like I expect that to be my experience, mm. and like it's very I don't even know what that's like. Well, it's you know, it's just it's a bizarre experience when you know you're. It, when you're very closely connect connected to someone who is well known, mm -hmm. um, and I have been very adamant so far about um, making sure that if someone is wants to work with me, that they want to work with me. Yeah, um, Exac that's exactly my point. Is that mm -hmm. I 
I'm around enough musicians and, and enough good people to know like how to be in certain situations. Mm-hmm. It's not it's not hard for me to understand situations. I'm pretty good at reading stuff. Um, so when I found out when you guys were connected, um, and let me be clear, like I have all of Foxygen's records. Like uh, they're a ba- me too, man. <laughs> they're they're, <a> <laughs> they're my favorite records. <laughs> <laughs> they're a band that, that means a lot to me. Um, it, it, they joined me for a lot of the most fun experiences of my life, but it it was it just immediately became secondary, like because there's no like I don't I don't do this um for networking, like I first did it to maybe like play more shows and get people to know more, like hey I've mm-hmm. got a band I'm doing this thing like. But I genuinely could talk to people for 23 out of 24 hours of the day. <laughs> like, I just love people. Most people. And I love creative people, like, mm-hmm. to a fault. Where I'm <laughs> like, I just want to hear what they have to say. And I want to, like, l- share, learn, and grow sort of thing. And I don't think you, I don't think anybody gets anything beneficial out of trying t- to network i don't think you'd get like i don't think at the end of the day or the end of this person's life Mm -hmm. they're gonna like be satisfied i just don't believe that i think i mean unfortunately it's sort of it's like a requirement in in any professional field like you have to meet people you have to make connections or whatever but i think you know and again it's like i cannot over over emphasize how important my like community like the music community that i am in Mm -hmm. is to me like i feel the same way it's the people that i know who are in music are my favorite musicians um they have like incredible work ethic Mm -hmm. you know it's like it's very inspiring to me to watch someone like go after it right um and also it's i mean it's they're huge influences and you know the people that i know are the people that i work with and um well let me just say that i um the reason i reach out to you the reason why i reach out to anybody to do the podcast is because i see that person working creating something being out there and like i feel and i hope that you feel this too that you are part of that community not just like like we're talking before an accessory to it thank you like you are Mm -hmm. doing this stuff you are just accepting to go on a random dude's podcast (laughs) and like talk about your music and your life and share like the creative side of you like as long as people are doing something i think it it you know what's something that I very recently learned? It took me forever to get here. It's like so, it just so many years to get here. You do not need permission to try. Yeah. You know, you don't need someone to validate you mm. in order to. It's like for a long time, I felt like I needed some kind of like seal of approval mm-hmm. before I was allowed to, you know, say like, you know, I want to do this. I want to like write songs and make albums and play shows and all these things. And I needed someone to look at me and go like, yeah, you are a musician too, or something like that. Right. You don't need that. And yeah. you're not going to, you're not ever going to get the approval that you are looking for if that's what you're looking for, you know? And so yeah. I had to decide like, you know what? Like, I don't need anyone to tell me that I'm good enough to try now. I'm just going to because I yeah. want to. That's insanely insightful and insanely hard to come to and i i still haven't come to that conclusion fully you know what i mean like or the practice of it like i'm i'm well aware of like what i want to do but like i just recently started doing live performances recording live performances Mm -hmm. with the people that come on the podcast and the re- I had always wanted to do it. And I have a bunch of different microphones and stuff at my office where people come in. But they're not like the right ones, the exact right ones, you know. <laughs> and so then this band comes in. We get all drunk and they're like, hey, let's do a live performance. <laughs> I'm like, okay. And so I'm setting it up. And as I'm setting it up and like realizing and like I'm hearing the takes, I'm like, oh, why didn't I just do this before? But I right. just like didn't accept that I should just 
do it. Right. And now Nike, just do it. <laughs> Nike, just do it. <laughs> uh, corporate sponsorships. Thank you. I do need new Nikes, by the way. I need new shoes in general. All of my shoes are on their way out. Really? I think I'm living in zombie shoes. They've died a long time ago, and I'm still shoving my foot in them. But yeah. Well, I'm happy that you are happy. I'm working on it. It's a work in progress. Yeah. Well, I'm happy that you're working on it. You seem um, (laughs) well-adjusted. I've met some crazy people, and um, you don't seem like one of the crazy ones. Oh, thank you. And... um, yeah, again, thanks for having me here and talking with me and being open and honest about so many things that uh, I wish more people were open and honest about. And, um, yeah, is there anything else you want to say before I wrap this up? I'm tired. <laughs> <laughs> All right. We are tired. Well, thanks so much for coming on the podcast. Shake my sweaty hand, my mic hand. And, um, yeah, thanks again. Thanks for I don't know how to end these, but, yeah, thanks. <laughs> you say bye. Bye. <laughs> All right, and up next we have Jackie Cohen performing a live version of her song for you. Thank you. For you, for you is always true. For you, for you is always true. In apartments, pretending We've got much more than we're spending Everything I do, I do for you We will never live forever So I need to tell you now Sad news from every room I've slept in in this town all things gleaming and clean will wear out and turn green. If I must turn to, I'll turn for you. I think you are just my size. I like the way I fill up your